Greetings and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for session five of the Tribal Juvenile Policy and Code Development Virtual Learning Series hosted by the OJJDP Tribal Youth Resource Center. Today's session is entitled Integrity of Tribal Juvenile Court Process as a Foundation, Adjudication Alternatives. And we have a lot to get through today, so we're gonna go ahead and get started in just a moment. Um, before we do, I'll walk us through some quick tech reminders to help our time together today go as smoothly as possible. My name is Laura Smith. I serve as a program assistant with the Tribal Youth Resource Center at Tribal Law and Policy Institute. First, just to note that your control panel will appear on the right side of your screen and that you can resize um, your screens to the desired size at any point during today's presentation. To help cut down on background noise, um, all attendees will be muted during the presentation today. Once you call into the meeting call line, please enter your PIN number to integrate the audio. If you'd like to minimize your control panel, you can do so by clicking the orange arrow at the top left of the panel. At any point during the session today, we invite you to use the questions box on your panel to submit questions um, and responses. And we'll respond to those um, throughout the presentation as we're able. The PowerPoint from today's session can be downloaded from the handouts bar in your control panel. And um, following the session, everyone who's here will receive an email that contains um, both the PowerPoint and a link to the evaluation for today's session. And we would be grateful if you could please uh, take a minute to complete that. And with that, I will hand things over to um, Anna Clough, our co-director at the Tribal Youth Resource Center and an amazing human being. Um, take it away, Anna. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate you sharing those tech reminders and uh, we would not be able to present today without the help of our program assistant, Laura. She is uh, always getting us prepared and ready to go for these presentations. So appreciate you um, and your contributions to this series and to this session. Uh, we are back today uh, joining you on behalf of the Tribal Youth Resource Center. We are a training and technical assistance provider um, for the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Uh, we currently serve CTAS Purpose Area 8 and 9, uh, which are tribal youth programs and tribal juvenile healing to wellness court grantees. Uh, but we also provide training and technical assistance to any federally recognized tribe and really any entity that would request support um, if you're serving tribal youth populations. So we are honored and humbled to be uh, in this work and walking alongside of you all. And we do as a team hold to the value that our children are sacred. And so we are um, very glad to be here today. I want to thank those of you who have been able to participate in all of the sessions, um, but we want to invite you if you missed any of the sessions prior to this one. Uh, we do have video links and materials that we can share with you. And so uh, even if you haven't gotten to participate thus far, uh, we will share materials and videos following this session for the entire series. So welcome if you're rejoining us and if you're new, uh, very glad that you're here with us today. You can go to the next slide. So we are very proud to welcome back our friend, uh, Pat Stika-Kwaptua, which she will pronounce her last name much better than I do. Um, but she serves as faculty in the Alaska Native Studies and Rural Development Department at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, we are so happy she's here because she brings a wealth of knowledge uh, with her experience working as a tribal appellate court judge and has authored many resources that support tribal justice systems and has a vast amount of experience working with tribes in Alaska Native villages. So thank you, Pat, for uh, facilitating this series. We look forward to uh, any of the follow-up that might come out of this and uh, looking forward to today's session. So I'm going to hand it off to her because we do have a lot to cover. And um, Pat, I believe you're going to share today's session objectives. 
Oh, I'm supposed to introduce myself. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, my name is Anna Club. I currently serve as a co-director for the Tribal Youth Resource Center and have the great opportunity to work with the Tribal Juvenile Healing to Wellness Court initiatives that are taking place across the country. And so thank you for allowing me to be here and help facilitate today's session. All right, next slide. I think I'm in order now. <clears throat> And I already uh, talked about who we served, so we're good to go. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Anna. So there's a slight delay on the slides coming up in front of me. Um, it'll just take a second here. I, I guess I can pronounce my name again. So uh, I'm Pat Sikyakwaptiwa, and I'm Hopi. I grew up on the Hopi Reservation in Arizona, and I find myself all the way up here in Alaska. So let's look at the overview for this session. Um, if you've been with us from the beginning, you know that we've been really focused on the model Indian Juvenile Code of 2016. And we've talked a lot about setting up our juvenile court systems. Um, so in this session, we're still talking about tribal juvenile justice system development. And we're still talking about how you divert youth out of the court system um, either from one docket to a more therapeutic docket or diverting out of the court to a diversion program. And of course, these diversion programs that we care so much about are focused on rehabilitation and treatment. And today we're also going to talk about um, other innovations, particularly through the tribal healing to wellness courts. And we're going to look at the Alaska case study. Next slide, please. And we need a little Jeopardy music. You may see the slide before I do. OK, so the specific learning objectives for this session are, are quite a few. We have about six of them here. Um, I suppose the first big thing that we'll want to get out of this session is that the model Indian Juvenile Code, the 2016 revision, is designed for a tribe that wants to exercise maximal tribal sovereignty in setting up its tr tribal juvenile justice system. So it's the whole shebang, and we're going to learn how it does that. Second, um, one of the purposes of the model is to focus on programs of supervision, treatment, and rehabilitation, and also coordination of services for children and families. Both of these with an emphasis on prevention, early intervention, diversion, and community-based alternatives. So these are all fancy words for we can do tribal healing to wellness courts, and it fits squarely within the purposes of the model code. The third thing that we're going to learn about today is how um, the tribal healing to wellness court or the drug court model is the current best practice for uh, therapeutically and culturally focused juvenile justice programming. Fourth, the Tribal Healing to Wellness Courts and programs are resource and collaboration heavy. So even though this is the ideal or the best practice, it really requires a lot of resources and collaboration. And so there may be practical challenges for some tribes in establishing wellness court dockets that are part of the tribal court, as opposed to just creating a diversion program, which also can be a wellness diversion program. The fifth thing we're going to learn about is that there are alternatives to establishing a wellness court docket, and you can still be a wellness court program. Um, now, if you didn't establish a tribal healing to wellness court docket tribe by tribe by tribe, you could do it through a regionalized wellness court or an intertribal court. You could also do it by sharing jurisdiction with the state, and these are known as joint jurisdiction courts. Finally, we're going to learn about how you can also do this through a non-court um, tribal or community diversion only program. 
And finally, if you are going to do an alternative, specifically a joint jurisdiction alternative, you're going to need to have agreements with your state or community counterparts. And these can be memorandums of agreement, memorandums of understanding, letter agreements, or other type of agree agreements. And so these are additional um, mechanisms that you'll need to have in place in addition to any code provisions that you're developing for your tribal court. Okay, next slide, please. So I, I'm pretty sure, uh, I suspect that you may be seeing this before I do. Um, you should be seeing a diagram taken from our overview of the model juvenile code provisions. And here is just the reminder that these big blue bubbles are the doorways, the procedural doorways to leave the tribal juvenile court system and move out either into a wellness court docket or into a diversion program. So these are either done by agreements with the young person and their family members, or it's done by court order under a deferred adjudication or a deferred disposition in under the model code provisions. Okay, next slide, please. So one of the really big questions that popped up as we were putting together the materials for these presentations and your TA providers, um, we realized that tribes are really having to face um, a question of whether they're gonna develop their tribal healing to wellness courts in the court, or whether it's going to be um, outside of the court in a program only model. And so this caused us to ask, does your tribe or community need a tribal juvenile code, depending on which way you're doing it. Are you trying to develop your court out or are you only doing a program? Um, and are there practical reasons for leaving the court side of the work with the state? Um, so you're still part of an overall tribal healing to wellness court if you're a diversion program, but the difference would be the state is operating the court part. So if you're a tribe and you're trying to figure this out, then you have to know the difference between creating it uh, in your tribal court system and, and only creating a diversion program. So if we look at it from the tribal court side, the arguments for developing out the process as part of the tribal court are that it's a more assertion, a more full assertion of tribal sovereignty. And also your court will be exercising jurisdiction over youth and families. Um, it is still habilitation and rehabilitation focused under the model juvenile code provisions. And of course, we just talked about you can transfer out of the straight up juvenile court process into the wellness court docket. Um, just reasserting here that you'd be creating two dockets or caseloads assigned to judges in the tribal court if you did it in the court. Um, and remember that some youth will stay in the juvenile court and won't get moved over into the tribal healing to wellness court docket. Now, if you are thinking about only a diversion program, then it's not attached to the tribal court at all. Um, it still can be therapeutic, of course. It still can include culture, custom, and tradition. It can include a, a hybrid of Western and Native justice and therapeutic elements. Um, and of course, this includes tribal healing to wellness programs. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And I'm going to go ahead and start talking a little early because I suspect you can always see the next slide before me. So um, one of the big questions that pops up from this, if you ask people that work either um, in federal Indian law circles or in Native American studies programs, if they're going to ask the question, um, is this really nation building if you have a diversion only program? 
Um, is it mere self-administration or is it self-government? And the difference is that through the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, uh, which was passed by Congress in the 1970s, um, that provided a means by which the federal government gave money directly to tribes so they could run their own programs. And there's been criticism over the years that this created um, in tribes, not nation building, but mere self-administration of programs, something less sovereign than full-blown control over the vision and development of your entire tribal government process. And um, the scholar that looked at this particularly is a man named Stephen Cornell. I believe he's an economist. And he notes that there are tribes that do full-blown self-governance, uh, full-blown nation building, and that they're the exceptions to mere self-administration. Um, they seize the authority of the government. Of, in other words, they fully exercise their tribal sovereignty. They govern, they, they do more than mere service delivery and they reshape their native nations according to their own design. And as part of this, they make an enforced law like adopting a full blown juvenile code, for example. Um, and they also negotiate relationships with other governments. So they can be strategic about how they flesh out tribal government and when they enter into agreements with other governments like states under the joint jurisdiction model. Um, and they do this strategically to exercise meaningful jurisdiction over lands and people within their borders. So I'll just read the quote from Stephen Cornell at the bottom here. He says, the shift from mere self-administration to self-government is a fundamental aspect of nation building. At its core, it is about reclaiming governance as an indigenous right and activity and then developing the tools to govern well. So I suspect he would argue that when it's strategically possible, tribal courts exercise their full powers of expanding their juvenile justice system, including the creation of tribal healing to wellness court dockets. However, he would recognize that it's within the strategic vision of self-governance to choose when and how to negotiate with state governments to fill in the gaps um, in the interim. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. So the next two slides are actually um, from Stephen Cornell and he creates a table of self-administration versus self-government. And he looks at factors like jurisdiction, governmental form, core governmental functions. Um, so for example, on the left-hand side of table 3.1, he's pointing out that self-administration is largely limited to management decisions within programs. And if you go all the way to the right-hand side, you can see that a self-governing tribe has more decision-making range um, about the form of their government, the size of their tribal court, how many dockets they have, um, and the resources. Um, uh, they, they also have intergovernmental relations and they have a strategy. They have some strategic planning that they've done about how they're gonna go about this. Okay, I'm not gonna go through all of these. So let's, um, let's jump to the poll question poll question number one, which is two slides from here. And Anna, if you want to jump in and note something, you're welcome to here. Sure, I will. We can read off the poll first and then maybe share a couple of thoughts while we wait for the responses or just after. Okay, um, uh, Anna, are you doing the polls or am I doing the polls? 
I think Laura's done them in the past, but I will jump in here. So self-government is different from self-administration of programs because in select all that apply. And I'll let Laura read off the results. Sounds good. We uh, are still getting a steady stream of responses coming in. So we'll leave it open another five, 10 seconds or so. For anyone who would still like to participate. All right, we'll get these shared. So the greatest responses we saw um, came in for um, establishing constitutional foundations and having to do with Native Nation accountability um, to citizens. And following that, we had a tie. Um, oh, sorry, go for it, Pat. Oh, I just, it's interesting. So definitely um, we're focusing on the difference between self-government and mere self-administration. And definitely self-government is about creating constitutional foundations. Hence, you'll see many tribes doing constitutional reform to make their laws their own. Um, it definitely is about accountability to citizens. It definitely includes intergovernmental partnerships. Um, and of course, it's designed by Native nations. And it's more than, it's not limited to management decisions, right? So the tricky language on the front of that one is, it is limited to. Um, Self-government is bigger than mere self-administration, mere management decisions within programs. And Anna, I didn't know if you wanted to maybe have a comment here. I did. I just I wanted to share when we look at the development of various diversion programs for tribal youth, including those of the Healing to Wellness Court, um, the importance of that, that authority, because I think that when we're integrating some of the more culturally relevant or locally um, guided practices, when you look at operationalizing an agreement with a local entity, sometimes there's disagreement there with the practices or the protocols that are going to be integrated within the core or within the program. And so I think it's really important to have those discussions on, um, you know, maybe there is the opportunity to develop develop a program and keep it in house programmatically um, and then later build those relationships within a local community if if they're not there at the outset of when you're starting to plan the program because I, I've seen where there isn't that collaborative working relationship with the county and so it's a lot more difficult um, to get a new program started or off the ground so I can see a lot of reasons and a lot of conversations that might need to be had within the community about you know the structure and the components within the program and whether a local partner or agency is going to be in agreement with what those are thank you anna okay let's see where we're at oh go ahead So I'm probably still seeing a delay. Um, I'm assuming we're going to the next slide. And I'm seeing the slides from the very beginning again. It's always an adventure. On uh, So on my view, Pat, <laughs> what we're seeing is slide 15, which is the, what is a tribal healing and wellness court? Okay, if you tell me what slide you're seeing, I can move from my paper slides. <laughs> okay. Okay, so what is a tribal healing to wellness court? So I'm assuming that a lot of you already are operating tribal healing to wellness courts, but you may have a new member or there may be someone who's exploring this um, for the first time on this webinar. So allow me to just do a little review here. So, of course, we know there's multiple names for this, um, this mechanism, right? 
Um, drug court was the original name in the state system. Uh, in the academic literature, they call them therapeutic courts. Uh, you might hear people say tribal drug court. And of course, we use the term tribal healing to wellness court, hence the TH2WCT acronym or other versions of that acronym. Now, there are different subtypes of these courts. Um, the original ones dealt with adult criminal dockets. And, um, and so we have that kind of drug court where some adult is charged with a crime related to substance abuse or drug abuse. We also have family drug courts. And there's juvenile drug courts, DUI drug courts, and veterans drug courts. And probably by now, there's more than even that that I haven't listed here. So how do participants, as opposed to defendants or delinquents, come into the system? Well, if they're an adult, they may have been charged with a crime. Um, well, they had to have been charged with a crime. If they're a young person, they may have been alleged to have committed a juvenile defense, and they're also screened to have a substance use or abuse issue. Or it's a parent who's been accused of child maltreatment, and they're screened to have a substance use or abuse problem. So these are different court dockets. They are therapeutic dockets. And as you can see, they're targeted at different um, sort of ways that people come into the court system. Now, to date, we were trying to do a count of how many actual active tribal healing to wellness courts there are. And we come up with about 117 right now nationally. Uh, 71 of them are of, of the adult variety, adult criminal. Six of them look like they're family. So that would be the parent accused of maltreatment version. And then 40 of them are juvenile. So this tells us that tribes have a great interest in the juvenile therapeutic model here. And of course, the, there's a lot of uh, criminal dockets as well. So that's, that's quite a large number, 117. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And I'll just start talking about it from my paper. Okay, so the next slide, um, you should have a, a picture of a Time Magazine cover that says Crack Kids on it. And this is to remind us of the origins of the Tribal Healing to Wellness Courts. So of course, this was an experimental therapeutic court that came up in the state court system during the 1980s. And it was, of course, initially attached to the adult criminal court docket. And the idea was to create a separate court docket with a separate judge who could handle um, or contend with the surge of drug offenders who were coming through the criminal justice system, but in a therapeutic way. And this became necessary because of the criminalization of cocaine and crack possession and use. And of course, the explosion of cocaine and crack cases in the big cities during the 1980s. So the states ran this experiment to do a more therapeutic and less punitive approach. And that experiment resulted in, or I should say influenced the development of tribal drug courts in the late 90s. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, the question is, are the goals of the tribal healing to wellness courts the same as those of the goals of the state drug court? And that's a, that's a big question. Um, and as you can see by your slide, I think the answer is not quite the same. So if you read the literature, the state drug courts uh, express three primary goals for having a drug court today. The first is to reduce the use of drugs and alcohol. And clearly, tribal healing to wellness courts have that same goal. The second is to reduce related criminal activity. And of course, tribal healing to wellness courts have that same goal. And in the juvenile context, they would want to reduce status offenses like truancy, for example. 
and delinquency as well. That's things that would have been a crime if they were committed by an adult. The third state drug court system goal is to increase the cost effectiveness of the juvenile justice system. So they have this third goal, which is they want to reduce the cost to the state of having youth, for example, in their system. Um, you know, they don't want uh, to be creating criminals uh, that will go into their prison system and be there for years and years. So they really look at the dollar side of things. And I think this tends not to be a goal of many tribal courts who are just trying to get services, basic services to their population. And they use the courts to do this sometimes, oftentimes, most of the time. Um, so I put a big question mark by number three. Now I'm not saying tribes shouldn't be cost conscious, they should. But I think it may not be as high ranking of a goal on the tribal court side. So the additional goals, I think, on the tribal healing to wellness court side are to provide uh, pro-social activities and interventions for Native youth. Let them have something, have some activities. Um, definitely to provide substance and behavioral treatment for Native youth, because that might not have been there before to provide some programs with hybrid cultural and Western treatment and justice elements, because that might not have been there before, or it may not have been culturally tailored before. And to fund and develop and enhance tribal courts and justice systems in general, because tribal courts are underfunded and they have to group monies together to provide basic functions. So there are definitely additional and maybe even different goals on the tribal healing to wellness court side um, that make them different from drug courts, not radically different, maybe radically different, depends tribe by tribe. Okay, let's take a look at the next slide. And maybe Laura, if you could just tell me when you all see the next slide. Sure thing, Pat. So right now we, we are seeing slide 18, the, the 10 key components slide. Okay, great. So um, as you all know, the Tribal Law and Policy Institute has worked with uh, Tribal Healing to Wellness Court judges and team members since the 90s. And over the years, um, different groups have come together to sort of boil down what are the 10 key components for Tribal Healing to Wellness Courts. And so there are 10 and they somewhat mirror the 10 key components um, for drug courts in the state system, but there are some differences. For example, under number one, um, one of the key components is that there's going to be a team approach to healing, uh, healing individuals, families and communities, but as part of nation, native nation building. So there's definitely sort of a sovereignty nation building element to number one that you wouldn't see under the key components for states. Um, and number four is also notable. Uh, a key component is treatment and rehabilitation, but that incorporates culture and tradition. So I'm not gonna go around the whole circle here. I'm pretty sure many of you have seen these before. But I would note that um, these original key components were designed for an adult criminal tribal court context. And so uh, it's a very important foundation to understand, but we wanna take a look at the juvenile context. So let's go to the next slide. I'm showing up for us now, Pat. Okay, great. So, um, in the state system, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges came up with 16, and we could call them key components, but they call them strategies to improve drug courts. And maybe someday we'll get um, a body of state um, judges and team members to come up with key components, but I actually think these are their key components. And we're at TLPI, we're actually looking at doing this tribe side as well. But notice how many more there are here. And 
uh, some of the ones that jump out that are different for juvenile courts are like, let's say number six, uh, building partnerships with community organizations to expand the range of opportunities available to youth and their families. And then seven, tailor interventions to the complex and varied needs of youth and their families. Eight, tailor treatment to ad uh, treatments to the developmental needs of adolescents. Uh, nine, design treatment to address unique needs of gender. Uh, let's see what else is in here. Uh, 12, for example, recognize and engage the family as a valued partner in all components of the program. 13, coordinate with the school systems. Okay, so I'm just kind of showing you how um, these are more refined and more focused for youth. And I see that perhaps Anna wants to jump in here. I was just sharing when we had a conversation in preparation for this session that we agreed that now there's a larger body of juvenile healing to wellness courts. And so we are very interested in having that conversation because I think we're starting to see a more full implementation. And I think there was already complexity involved with the healing to wellness court, but when you add also the layer of working with parents and caregivers and families and all of the things that go into moving youth into treatment, uh, it's a lot of work to get a juvenile healing to wellness court fully implemented and going. So I just wanted to share that we are interested in that. So if you are operating a juvenile healing to wellness court and you're a great team and interested in meeting with us, we, we are looking forward to having some conversations about um, some protocols just across the board that we're seeing. Great, time for a poll it looks like. All right, so we'll launch our next poll. The question is, which additional goals would you add for your tribal healing to wellness court? You can select as many answers as you like. And the choices are to strengthen families and keep them together, to provide pro-social activities and interventions, to provide hybrid cultural and Western elements, to support slash develop the tribal court, and to increase cost effectiveness. And if you haven't voted yet, I have about 10 more seconds. Okay, I'll go ahead and bring up the responses. So we have a couple ties here again, but the 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 first two, um, just under 80% each, are strengthening families and keeping them together and providing pro-social activities and interventions. And I'll hand it over to Pat and Anna, if there's anything you'd like to add here. Interesting. So there were no right or wrong answers here. This was purely to uh, for us to hear from you. Uh, and 93% to support develop tribal court. That is understood. You know, as a tribal judge myself, I know that reality. We have to um, we have to support our tribal court development, and that's really important. Um, the other two big numbers were strengthen families and keep them together and provide pro-social activities and interventions for youth. Also very, very important. And also notably, I think, um, parallel to cultural priorities for a lot of us. And yet cost effectiveness is still there um, because we just don't have the dollars to go around, right? Anna, did you want to have a, a comment on the poll results? No, I just agreed with what you just shared. And I would say just from the, the courts that we've worked with in the last few years, that these would be priorities um, that have been shared as part of their um, planning and, and looking toward implementation. 
Great. And Laura, just let me know when the next slide pops up. We'll do Pat. So right now we're seeing um, slide 21. What is the process for referral screening and comprehensive assessment in a juvenile drug court? Okay, great. So at the back of my mind in putting this presentation together, I'm asking the strategic question, when should a native community decide to develop a uh, tribal healing to wellness court docket versus a program, a diversion program that is not attached to the court necessarily, that perhaps is attached more to a state court process. And so in order, and I, then I ask myself, what criteria would I wanna think about in trying to make that decision? Well, let's look at what's required for a tribal healing to wellness court. And so we all know that one of the, the big first steps is understanding how you move young people into your tribal healing to wellness court docket. How do they get referred? How do they get screened? How do they get assessed? Um, and there, it's a multi-level process, right? So um, when we're trying to figure out who the target population is, um, we have to figure out where those young people are they coming from. Are they coming from the school system? Are they coming from a treatment program? Are they coming through the juvenile court? Maybe a probation officer um, or one of the juvenile court officers. Um, how how do we know you know how they're going to come in? And then um, how do we know whether they should be in the program? So there's a multi-level screening assessment here in tribal healing to wellness courts where they look at legal eligibility, clinical um, um, appropriateness, and they look at social factors. So on the legal side, um, you're looking at whether they have a history of involvement with the juvenile justice system, whether state or tribal. Um, have they committed an offense that qualifies for this program? Um, what is their current offense? What, what are they charged with? And there may be requirements under tribal and state law, or there may be requirements under federal funding. Um, so for example, you might have a tribal healing to wellness court grant of one category or another under CTAS, and I hope I still have that right. Um, and it may limit funding for youth if they don't meet certain requirements. And Anna, did you want to say a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I know currently there are some provisions about youth who are violent offenders. And so um, that seems to be the case, I think, in both Purpose Area 8 and Purpose Area 9. I'll have to check that. But um, if they have a felony level offense that sometimes can uh, impact the use of funding um, for them to enter into a healing to wellness court. Um, but I think another uh, consideration is age. So I know the OGGDP recently increased the age. So if you have youth who are coming in who are older, you can actually use that funding up to age 21. And so I know that a, a lot of courts have looked at that bridge period between um, a youth entering into the court, maybe they age, come to the age of majority, but they really still need the services and the support that are being offered. And so you're actually able to extend that uh, period of time where you can offer services um, up to the age of 21. Okay. And so there seems to be a lot of requirements here and your team will develop these screening eligibility uh, criteria as part of the development of your tribal healing to wellness courts. Um, can we go back one slide? I'm seeing the phases already. Um, just go back to the one we were looking at before. I was trying and, to be sneaky and get ahead of us, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, I just needed to talk about one more thing. <laughs> okay. That would have been it's, great though. <laughs> it's it's back on that slide, the, the process for okay. referral slide. Okay, so I'm still looking at the screening column. And 
remember now that there's also the clinical screening. Is this person a good candidate for the Tribal Healing to Wellness Court? Can it give them things they need? Um, so if they don't have a substance use or abuse problem, then why are they in a therapeutic docket designed for that, right? So uh, the clinical screening is going to look at their substance use history and patterns. Also, we know many, if not most of our folks, uh, our, our youth, they do need some mental health, behavioral health, trauma-informed um, treatment. And so that's another uh, screening that would be done. Also educational screening, and then looking for red flags for additional assessment, more involved, professionally done assessment and evaluation. And then third, um, quite a number of programs will also look at the willingness and motivation of the young person to provide, uh, to participate in the program, because if you have limited slots, you want to give it to people who are ready and motivated to do this, as opposed to those who are not. Um, and I admit that in the tribal context, we often will make slots for anyone who needs it. So uh, this is taken from the, the state system screening. All right, so one thing that should be jumping out from all of this is, do we have the people who can do the screening? And do we have the professionals who can do a, a behavioral health, mental health assessment? Um, you know, do we have the trauma-informed aspect um, in all of this process? And these are resource-heavy questions. Okay, now we can go to the next slide. All right, and now we can see the um, what does treatment and rehabilitation look like in a juvenile drug, juvenile drug court slide. Okay, so these are the, the famous uh, phased treatment plans. This one is the model um, that you would look at when you were designing your specific approach in your tribal healing to wellness court. Um, I'm not going to talk down the entire list, but I note that if you look in phases one and two, about halfway down, you'll see frequent drug testing, and that should include alcohol testing and establish a service plan, including treatment and education. So this phase one um, period where you have young people in your tribal to healing to wellness court, um, they're going to be um, given a phase treatment plan. And that means that you have to have treatment services, right? and treatment professionals, whether we're talking about the substance side or the behavioral health side, um, or more involved um, uh, psychological uh, treatment, um, that, those are resources that you're going to need to be able to give those services to them so they can move through these phases, which may last from months to even years sometimes. Um, Okay, and this is all taken from the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. They're helping to create the sort of uh, broad phase treatment map. And then of course you have individualized phase treatment plans for, or I should say treatment plans for, for your uh, participants one by one by one in your program. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And the next, let me see, I thought it advanced, it says, it, it might be, does it say phase movement on it? There we go, I see it. Yep, okay, great. Okay, so um, those of you who are also doing the Tribal Healing to Wellness courts know that um, youth graduate from one phase to the next, otherwise known as phase movement. And to do this, um, you had to have had your specialized programs, whether they're anger management classes or um, MRT, um, moral recognition therapy. There's a whole basket of 
specialized programs and services that you would have had to have to build out these phases. Um, you also would have had to have the treatment programs, as we mentioned before. Um, and you'll see that these repeat uh, across phase one, phase two, three, and four. Okay, so these are pretty fancy plans here. Uh, these phase treatment program plans and phase movement plans, um, very involved and involving youth and their families and the service providers and the treatment providers. Okay, let's go one more forward. All right, it's loaded for us, the reality check. Okay, so the reality check on the right-hand side here. Do we have treatment providers who can work with the youth included in our target population? Are there enough treatment slots available? Do we have community resources, services, and programs for this particular population? Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see uh, other considerations like how old, like what age range are we going to be working with here? If they're very young, it might have uh, implications for treatment. If they're on the older side, you know, 18 to 25, that will have implications. Um, court status, are we talking about status offenses like running away and truancy? Are we talking about um, what would be a felony if it was in the state court system? Um, remember, just because you're in tribal court doesn't mean it can't look felonious, right? Because each tribe adopts their own criminal code and they may label certain conduct that would fall in the high crime area. And just because they don't name it a felony, it doesn't mean it isn't a, a more serious crime. Gender, you could have a court that only focused on girls. Um, severity of drug and alcohol problem, previous involvement or first offense. There's a lot of things to think about here. And I'll turn it over to Anna. I just wanted to share when we talk about the different services that are going to be offered within the court, um, we had some discussions about sustainability. So if you are able to implement a grant funded project, uh, we were looking at the term of the project. And so if you begin services, looking at if our funding were to end, are we going to still be able to support these youth who are receiving treatment or behavioral health services? So I know that that's a really big consideration. Um, you wanna make sure that there's continuity there. And then I think what we're seeing um, just other resources and coll the collaboration necessary. So if you're just getting started or you don't have a wellness court grant um, right now, but you're thinking about it, having that collaboration between the different departments um, prior to the application is very helpful because you're looking at collaboration for the supervision of the youth, um, all the other services that are being coordinated, and then even with your local county partners. So I think those are some major considerations if you're interested in starting a juvenile healing to wellness court. Thank you, Anna. And I think we're at a poll question again. Yep, we'll get the next poll question pulled up shortly. It's reality check. What is your system missing? You can select as many options as apply. Um, treatment providers, substance and or behavioral, treatment slots slash beds, community services and programs for youth, alcohol and drug testing, and support groups. And we'll leave this up just a little bit longer to give everyone time to vote. All right, see, I see a couple more still coming in. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results.
And so this time the, the highest, 73%, um, came in with treatment slash, slash, bed, slash beds, followed by a tie with community services and programs for youth and support groups, then treatment providers, and then 27% of respondents um, shared alcohol and drug testing. So this is definitely an affirmation of the um, fact that tribal healing to wellness courts are resource heavy and that all of these things are very important to make it fly. Um, and treatment is key. And it's probably, uh, it's looking like that might not be very well fully funded for a lot of tribes. Um, I guess we could go to the next slide. And just tell me okay. when you see it. Yep, almost not quite this time. Okay, now okay. It's okay, I can see it now. It's behaving itself for the moment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we have um, a handful of new, uh, newer grantees in Alaska. And the Alaska case study for tribal healing to wellness courts is interesting because of all the hurdles we have in the lower 48, they have even more. And so they have to be very strategic about how they develop out their tribal healing to wellness courts and or programs. And it's maybe instructive for the rest of us to look at what their considerations are. So I put the, the famous map of how big Alaska is um, up here because what is extra unique about them is distance. The distance that some of many of the rural villages are from hub towns or big cities is vast. It's like the distance between states sometimes. And to add to that, um, many rural tribes are off the road system. That means that in the winter, you're talking about traveling by a snow machine or four wheeler. And in the summer, you're talking about traveling by boat um, or air travel. And it's not easy to get back and forth. And so they have a system where most of their consistent service provision, like for uh, substance abuse treatment or behavioral treatment, for many villages means getting on an airplane uh, to get there. And then you add the weather and the geography on top of it, the planes don't always fly. So they're trying to do tribal healing to wellness courts in a very difficult geographic, weather, infrastructure, and I will now add the Alaska budget crisis context on top of it, and it's very challenging. So let's take a look at some of the details of what we're seeing up here. Next slide, please. All right, Pat, it's loaded, the challenges slide over here. So there were no shortage of challenges. I found 10 and I just was ticking them off off the top of my head. Um, so the first one is that Alaska tribal courts at the village level are underfunded and underdeveloped. And I almost could say not funded. <laughs> and so that's a huge problem, right? And the second is that because the state of Alaska has so late in the game, recognized tri tribal sovereignty and tribal court jurisdiction. There's a history now and a precedent where the state court and the state juvenile justice system do the original intake of people, of native people who come into the criminal justice or juvenile justice systems. And that has been the status quo. And so changing that is an uphill battle. The third, and for the same reasons, state law enforcement takes the lead 
for public safety in rural Alaska, and they do it with insufficient resources. Um, and now they do it with even greater insufficient resources because Alaska is experiencing a really huge uh, budget crisis. The, the state is almost like a tribe, not having enough money to run all its institutions right now. And there's a lot of fighting going on in the legislature, or I should just say, they're trying to figure out how to pay for things. Okay, the fourth is that um, there is recent state court, state Supreme Court recognition of tribal sovereignty and jurisdiction, but right now the state sees tribal jurisdiction as only being over members and not territory. And so um, villages are very small and there are many villages. And so if each village only has jurisdiction over its members, then you got to think about the problem of um, how they do their governing where jurisdiction is so limited. The fifth is that there's confusion over territorial jurisdiction and that causes confusion about tribal healing to wellness courts. Um, now remember that our drug court model started out as a criminal model. And so it feels like it's a criminal system process. And if you're in a state where they only recognize that tribes have civil jurisdiction, then they're gonna get confused and frustrated about whether or not a tribe has a drug court jurisdiction, basically. And so some of that is going on um, because, um, and I'll explain this later, the US Supreme Court has held that it, it doesn't see Indian country um, in most of Alaska. And most of these rural vi villages are not seen to have Indian country. Six, there's, uh, oh, I did this one already. Uh, let's do seven. Um, the services are regionalized. So a lot of the services are only available in hub towns or in the big cities. And so village by village, you might not have a substance um, ab abuse treatment provider or a behavioral health person. You might, they might fly in once a month or every other month, but they're not there every day. And so that really creates some difficulties for the drug court model. Um, law enforcement is also regionalized. They're not there every day. Um, or villages um, may have had someone, but they don't have them consistently. Um, you see this uh, article on the right-hand side of the slide where uh, this one village is, is lamenting the fact that they don't have a village public safety officer um, because he killed himself. And, and it's a hard job, right? You're really torn to be the sole public safety officer um, policing your friends and family and where the job is so overwhelming. And then I've already mentioned geography and weather and that there is lack of sufficient funding all the way around. Okay, let's jump to the next slide. It's loaded for us, Pat. The oh, okay, so uh, Commission. great. So about, what is this now, 11 years ago, um, Congress created a national commission called the Indian Law and Order Commission to take a look at uh, criminal justice systems serving Native American and Alaska Natives all over the country. And it, uh, in about three years, they reported back to the president and Congress with their report and they had done some um, time up in Alaska. They flew up to Alaska and traveled around the state, talked to people, interviewed people. And as a result of that, they end up uh, dedicating a whole chapter, uh, chapter two in their report to Alaska. And it's called Reforming Justice for Alaska Natives. The time is now. And let's take a look at the next slide, which has their report conclusions. It's up on our screen. So the ILOC ends up uh, finding that there are um, 229 federally recognized tribes in Alaska. 
with about 78 tribal courts at that time and that more were being developed. They also note the funding constraints and they note the, the narrow um, jurisdiction limitations for tribes and tribal courts in Alaska. They talk about how um, most of the tribal courts seem to be only handling child welfare cases and customary adoptions and things like uh, disorderly conduct and maybe minor juvenile offenses. And I would say that that even looks pretty bigger than what I see in a lot of places. So not exercising the full blown possibilities for a tribal court. And so they recommend, um, they recommend the following. They would like to see that the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act be amended and also the Indian country statute be amended. These are federal laws. And that how so? They would like to see that village fee lands are Indian country. So they just want Congress to come out and say, Alaska villages have Indian country over their village lands. Um, and also to allow tribes in Alaska to take lands into trust so they can increase their territorial jurisdiction to larger than just their private property. And they'd like to see an increase in resources, both federal and state, uh, to tribes so that tribes can deal with local law enforcement and justice system development and operations. And they say Congress should affirm, this reminds me of the Duro Fix statute, Congress should affirm the inherent criminal jurisdiction of Alaska Native tribal governments within the external boundaries of their villages and over their tribal members. So they want Congress to tell Alaska basically, no, they also have criminal jurisdiction and territorial jurisdiction. Now, none of these recommendations have been met by Congress. So this is still a wish list um, that tribes wishing to exercise their full sovereign powers um, would want to push for up here in Alaska. Okay, we can do the next slide. Okay, it's loaded. Okay, great. So the drug of choice up here um, is definitely alcohol. And I will point out that this is the drug of choice for Alaskans in general. This is not just an Alaska native problem. Um, and this is true um, high alcohol consumption and binge drinking rates for men, women, and youth, definitely youth. Um, in addition, in rural Alaska, they have what are called local option laws. So um, communities can vote to be um, what, what they call wet, dry, or damp. So they can either uh, have prohibition of the sale and use of alcohol full blown or something less. Um, and so this has given rise to like a homebrew or denatured alcohol uh, market. And there are all kinds of sort of alcohol substitutes that are used. And so their drug courts may be dealing with um, varied substance use that's alcohol related, but not exactly just alcohol. And as we know, this impacts things like motor vehicle accidents, DUIs, um, other things, fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorders, all the health issues here, um, and the violence issues as well, um, which are all very, very high, indeed, maybe the highest in the country up here. Other uh, substances that pop up, why is this important? Because we know when we design uh, tribal healing to wellness courts, we have to know what kind of substances we're dealing with, um, because the treatment programs have to be designed to deal with those. So we also know there's marijuana, cocaine, and um, to a lesser degree, methamphetamine and heroin. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, the diagram's up. Okay, great. So um, 
let me talk you through this somewhat involved slide here, and then we'll do a poll question. So the Tribal Healing to Wellness Court model assumes that a tribe has a tribal court system that's developed. And it also assumes that you're gonna modify that court system. But what if your tribe only has a tribal council and they don't have a tribal court? Then all of this seems uh, very involved and additional. And I think part of the communication between the Tribal Healing to Wellness Court um, technical assistance providers and Alaska tribes have to be where the starting point is here. So many villages up here do have, um, I would say, um, nascent tribal codes that set up a court system. And that's represented by the blue boxes going across the top here. So um, they have, uh, it's possible that um, in, in their law, it says that if there's a young person that's alleged to have violated some kind of offense, that a petition can be filed in tribal court and there can be a hearing and then there can be a disposition or a sentencing and it'll be things like fines, community work, traditional activities, counseling, restitution, banishment is even on the list here. And that'll be about it. Their tribal code will be very short and that that's all it will do. Um, this assumes they actually have tribal judges that are not tribal council members, but in many villages, they've just got the tribal council. So they would have to um, either hire or appoint and train separate tribal judges to do the blue on top. Now we know that a tribal healing to wellness court creates a whole secondary layer uh, in a tribal court docket, a second set of judges, or a, it's the same judge who then just sort of takes his hat off from the juvenile system and puts his hat on for the Tribal Healing to Wellness Court. So in this second layer then, we've got a team of people, including treatment providers, who are meeting weekly um, to um, review each case and to assist um, and report back about the treatment. There are weekly wellness court hearings where all of the um, team members and the um, participants, the young people and their families are there. Um, there's a phased individualized treatment plan. There's random alcohol and drug testing. There might be cultural programming in addition to this. And of course, that young person is moving from phase to phase over months or years. And they may graduate from the entire phased program, in which case they're no longer in the justice system and their, their records can be purged, um, or they may fail the, the phases and they're terminated from the program. And then they might show up either back in tribal court or in Alaska state court or in the juvenile justice system of the state of Alaska. So this is a lot of process for one small village to tackle under a drug court grant. Um, it, it's wonderful if you can pull the money and the resources village by village, but it may be necessary to do this in an inter-tribal way or under a joint jurisdiction approach. Um, okay, let's do a poll question. All right, what are some of the challenges that your tribe faces? Select all that apply. Underdeveloped tribal laws, ordinances, codes, statutes, tribal council is the tribal court, lack of trained tribal judges, lack of state cooperation with tribal court, and lack of local law enforcement officers. Select one or more. And we'll keep it open for just a few more seconds. Still seeing some responses coming in. 
I do think we need some music. I agree. For this yes, part. we need every music. Oh. Let's see. All right, so 73% responded lack of state cooperation um, with tribal court, followed by underdeveloped tribal laws, then lack of local law enforcement officers, lack of trained tribal judges, and then jumping down a little bit, um, only 27% of respondents shared tribal council is the tribal court. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Um, so let's tackle the big one first, lack of state cooperation with tribal court. Um, so there's definitely precedent for these joint jurisdiction courts. And I can see the possibility in Alaska because the state budget is in such crisis. I can see the possibility that tribal assertions of uh, tribal sovereignty and, and uh, tribal court development might be more successful in the future because the state isn't going to be able to take all of those cases. Um, so there may be an opportunity in this crisis for tribal court development in Alaska. And maybe that's true in the lower 48 too, given our, our national economic circumstances. Um, let's see, let's look at the next one underdeveloped tribal laws. Well, thank goodness we have the model juvenile code because that gives us a platform to go back and look at the existing tribal laws and bring them up to speed. And I'll just remind you that there's, um, there's a juvenile delinquency title in the model code and there's a truancy title. So even if you wanted to start small and just do the truancy portion, you could. Um, if you wanted to do the full shebang, you could adopt the whole thing. Um, if you wanted to work with the TA providers and modify the code uh, to just do status offenses or maybe um, have less rights protection but still have some rights protection so you don't have lawyers in your system, talk to your TA providers to about how to do that. There are ways to sort of shrink it down and um, take it left or take it right. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, quite a number of you had tribal council as tribal court. So that, uh, in, that requires some law change and training uh, in your system, also related to the model juvenile code. Lack of local law enforcement officers is huge. And this is another area where tribes in Alaska are going to need to seek funding and training if they want tribal police officers, because right now the village public safety officer program is a state program. And we could also lobby uh, for more, I might have said a dangerous word, um, we can advocate for more um, state VPSOs also, or maybe better training, but that whole area really needs to be reformed up here. Okay, um, Anna, did you wanna say anything about this poll? I did, I was going to share um, like Alaska tribal juvenile healing to wellness courts who are trying to implement in public law 280 states where we're seeing that obvious need for state tribal court collaboration so that they can uh, work their referral process so that youth can actually enter into the court. And then I wanted to just quickly share um, that we are having our Tribal Youth National Conference at the end of this month. And I'm really um, excited that we're going to be having a tribal state collaboration panel. And on the panel, we are going to be talking about a wellness court that is working directly with the State Office of Juvenile Affairs and like the programmatic model that we're discussing, uh, youth are referred into the Healing to Wellness Court from the Office of Juvenile Affairs and it's really operated as a, a programmatic effort and then if there's compliance and cases can get dismissed and if the youth were to need to go back into the state court system, um, they're referred back and they, they have had um, both types of cases come up and so 
uh, it seems to be working well, and we're going to have a, hopefully a good discussion about um, their processes and how that relationship has been working over the last couple of years. Great. Let's go to the next slide. All right. It's it's uh, loaded on our end, Pat. Okay, so hopefully you're taking a look at the Kenaitse Indian Tribe um, proposed juvenile wellness court. So I just wanted to highlight Kenaitse. So this is a tribe that's um, located in Southeast Alaska. They're sort of across the water from Anchorage. And they're in the town of Kenai. So it's a town and a tribe, and they have this beautiful um, wellness center there and their tribe has been very active in working with the local uh, superior court judge in the state system. They have a joint jurisdiction system and uh, it's they call it a joint jurisdictional project. <clears throat> they started out focused on adults and families, not juveniles, and they had a system where the tribal chief judge um, judge Kim Sweet of Kenaitse and the Kenai Superior Court Judge Anna Moran sat together on cases. So they co-judged cases and then they moved them through um, the state and tribal systems working together. And it, it was a beautiful thing. Um, and they decided to expand it or at least get a grant to expand it to the juvenile context. Um, I don't know if they ever fully launched the Juvenile Healing to Wellness Court, but Kenai and Kenaitse had the ideal circumstances of being right there next to each other with the full blown system, right? All their treatment providers were right there. They, were, they had a tribal um, a wellness center. They had a, a well-developed um, youth program. They had a well-developed circle process. Um, they just had all the bells and whistles in one place and they could make it work. And so they've been experimenting with this. And I just wanted to highlight and recognize the Kenaiti Indian tribe for their efforts here. Um, and uh, so that you know you can reach out to them and see if you could contact any of these folks to see how they did what they did. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And indeed, uh, Laura, can we jump two slides ahead? to the debates about tribal courts? Yep, it is now up. Okay, so I wanted to just um, pose some of the, the debates. I don't, I don't necessarily wanna advocate for a direction here. I just want you to see the arguments. So some native and non-native critics argue that the drug court model is a federally incentivized Western model at best, and at worst, it's a Western colonial imposition. Some Native folks um, are frustrated with the Western adversarial process. Um, they may also be frustrated with Western um, substance uh, and behavioral health treatment approaches. And some of them will argue that um, the appropriate approach, the only one, is an Alaska Native one that's culturally driven. Um, and then when I look at these, it looks to me like these are prevention focused as opposed to intervention focused, things like culture camps and circle process where you involve more of the extended family and the community in um, accountability and overseeing treatment for a, a young person. Okay, let's go ahead to the next one. Okay, it's loaded. So tribal advocates then will argue that a hybrid or a syncretic model is okay to do, meaning you can combine elements from the Western system and the native cultural system and create something new, that this should be okay. Um, particularly, they're looking at the adult and juvenile courts where they provide tribally controlled interventions that would not otherwise be available. Um, and also you have control because they're in your tribal system, not in the state system. So they would argue that tribes and their tribal healing to wellness court teams plan, design and implement 
their conception of what the tribal healing to wellness court should be. And federal funding is an opportunity. It gives them the opportunity to design something tailored to tribal laws, culture, and values. It's local and it's under tribal control. Um, and that while the National Association for Drug Court Professionals provides a model and training, um, it's ultimately up to the tribes to design their mob, their program. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, and we're seeing the state and NADCP. Okay, so um, now state programs, drug court programs, and the National Association for Drug Court Professionals might argue that Alaska tribes lack fully elaborated tribal court systems. They don't have all their tribal laws in place. They don't have um, their criminal family and juvenile court dockets, and they don't have the therapeutic docket. They would say that the circle process may be part of, but cannot be a substitute for the entire tribal court, nor can it be a substitute for the tribal drug court system they would see circle process as a type of diversion that is not a drug court. It does different things to do to achieve different results. And next slide. It's up. Okay. So uh, these are still the critiques of the state. And when I say state here, I mean the state drug courts and the National Association of Drug Court Professionals who provide all the training for the state drug courts. So they might argue that because Alaska tribes do not house or control their treatment, and I mean village by village by village, that um, these that they can't, that it's gonna be very difficult for them to move people through a phased treatment program at the village level. And for folks outside of Alaska, um, I just wanted to point out that um, village or tribal governments in Alaska, a lot of their treatment programs, remember, are housed in regional native nonprofits that are located far away. And so if you look at the diagram here, um, to the far right, you see the list of the regional native nonprofits, which are like, uh, Arctic Slope Native Association, Kawarik, Manilik, dot, dot, dot. Um, and so they do have programs and they are treatment programs, but they're very far away and they are run by nonprofits. Um, and so not all those dollars come down to the village level. So the assumption from the point of view of the National Association for Drug Court Professionals is that it will be hard for these tribes to have fidelity to their model. That means it's going to be hard for them to follow the precise model that the National Association of Drug Court Professionals sets out um, because those villages can't access day-to-day -day elements of the phase treatment plan. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And let's see how much I can get through here. Um, the last critiques that the state drug courts and NADCP would have um, are that uh, Alaska tribes don't house or control their law enforcement entities. So this makes it uh, difficult to do the monitoring, like probation-like activities and drug and alcohol testing. Um, they may be served, the villages may be served by village public safety officers, but they are also coordinated through those regional native nonprofits that are very far away. Um, and so perhaps only a state tribal joint jurisdiction drug court would work for those tribes that, are, that don't house all of these services in the villages. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So I need to give you the counter arguments and I apologize for just running over a bit here, um, but I wanna be sure and get the tribal healing to wellness courts and tribal point of view here. And Laura, just let me know if you Go can see that it. slide. Yep. Okay. Yep, it's up. Great. So, so what would the tribe say 
who want to do a tribal healing to wellness court. They would say, hey, look, we've been trying to develop and we're actively involved in developing our court systems and laws. These systems have been previously externally suppressed and under-resourced. Um, it's a violation of US federal Indian law principles and trust responsibility to impede our uh, desire and efforts to do so, to develop our court system and our laws. And it's also a violation of uh, indigenous people's rights under the uh, UN Declaration of uh, the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Our systems need to be supported and um, our capacity building needs to be supported. They might also recognize that um, they have used circle process um, successfully in many tribes. And while it, that it is important to them, and it's not the only possibility, um, the Tribal Healing to Wellness Court could find ways to integrate or refer with that process. Each tribe is sovereign. Each tribe has the prerogative to experiment and design hybrid models, to innovate and to integrate a uh, circle process as a part of their whole system. Um, many tribes in Alaska want to be seen to be exercising their tribal court jurisdiction and sovereignty and be respected in that and not be treated as mere diversion programs to the state system. So there's definitely a respect element here. Okay, let's go to the next slide. It's loaded. So um, this is really uh, um, some of what I just said as well. Um, Alaska tribes are sovereign. They have sovereign authority. They do need assistance um, with resources and funding and coordination. Um, it's worth exploring uh, intertribal drug courts. It's worth exploring tribal state joint jurisdiction uh, drug courts. Um, however, there will be a need for respect and collaboration between the states and tribes uh, here in Alaska. Okay, so let's do our last poll question and then I'll conclude. Okay, which of the following are alternatives to a tribal healing to wellness court docket? Select all that apply. Circle process alone, a tribal healing to wellness court diversion program, an intertribal tribal healing to wellness court, and a tribal state joint jurisdiction court. And this is not only the last poll question of the day, but the last poll question of our learning series. So this is the moment. <laughs> All right, just a few more seconds. Okay, closing the poll. Okay, so we got two ties at 82%, a Tribal Healing to Wellness Court diversion program and an intertribal Tribal Healing to Wellness Court, followed by a Tribal State Joint Jurisdiction Court, and then 27% with circle process alone. Great. <laughs> so this one definitely was a trick question. Um, I, I toyed with using the word substitute for a drug court instead of alternatives, um, in which case a circle process alone could not be a substitute for a drug court because they do different things. They're different things. Um, but it is an alternative um, to any court process for that matter. Um, so all of these are alternatives, but the last three are the ones that could still be drug court related. Um, you could have a, a diversion program that has all the bells and whistles of the um, tribal healing to wellness courts, but the state is actually the court part. 
you could have an inner tribal tribal healing to wellness court it's all tribal but you've got tribes working together in a more local region um, and of course you can have the tribal state joint jurisdiction court and there's a whole bunch of varieties of that that we didn't talk about okay let's uh take a look at oh anna did you want to say anything no i'll let you conclude and then we'll do some closing announcements okay great so let's look at our lessons learned today i feel like we need a code word pat but it's up <laughs> <laughs> okay great so the first lessons learned is that remember that model code sets out the provisions if you want to maximally exercise tribal sovereignty over over your tribal juvenile justice system the second lesson learned is that the purposes of the model code fit the tribal healing to wellness court. They fit therapeutic courts. The third is that the tribal healing to wellness court or drug court model is currently the best practice for therapeutically and culturally focused juvenile justice programming. Uh, and I should say dealing with substance related alcohol or drug issues. Okay, let's do the next slide. These are our final lessons learned. And they have loaded. Okay, so number four, um, all that said, we've learned that tribal healing to wellness courts and programs are resource and collaboration heavy. And there may be practical challenges for some tribes that seek to establish either the court version or the program version. So what are the key considerations to think about when you're planning for either the court version or an alternative? The first one is you need to ask yourself whether you actually want the court version. Do you wish to develop your tribal court system with the therapeutic docket? The second, do you wish to incorporate a hybrid therapeutic approach um, like Western, substance and behavioral health treatment and traditional and cultural approaches. Third, does your community have regular access to the substance abuse and behavioral health treatment, or are you gonna go seek funding to build these out as part of your tribal court? Um, four, does your community have regular access to monitoring, testing and law enforcement services, or are you gonna go get money to build that out? You can do that. Um, finally, for number four, or is it necessary to rely on the state? And I'll say strategically, meaning you, you have a strategic plan and that's a step in it before you decide down the road to do it all yourself. There may be a point at which you rely on the state to do one or more of the things above, like they do the juvenile court process or they provide the treatment services, or they do the probation or law enforcement, or any combination of those. Five, alternatives to the establishment of the wellness court dockets include creating a regional tribal wellness court or an inner tribal wellness court, or a joint jurisdiction, a tribal state joint jurisdiction court. And you can always continue to do to build a non-court diversion only program. So it's more like a, a community program and you're catching cases probably from the state court system or the juvenile justice system of the state. Six, should a tribe or a community wish to pursue an alternative, this is going to require written agreements probably like a memorandum of agreement or memorandum of understanding or a letter agreement or a compact. We actually have a compact in the child welfare area with tribes in the state up here in Alaska. And that is in addition to your code provisions. Um, so those are the big six lessons learned for this presentation. Um, so I'm gonna say thank you very much for spending time with me today. And I'm gonna turn things back over to Anna. Thank you, Pat. And we want to say a thank you overall for facilitating this entire series. Uh, like I shared before, we will be sharing the completed series, the videos and the materials 
for all of the sessions. So um, we know that there will be follow up. I did put the training and technical assistance request uh, link in the chat box. So if you are not an OGGDP grantee, but you're interested in training and technical assistance, we are happy to provide that and connect you with additional training and resources if you are working on continued code or policy development in your community. So I just want to say a thank you. I know we're over time, but you can always contact us via the Tribal Youth Resource Center website or via email. And I do want to say a special thank you to Laura Smith, who is our program assistant and has coordinated um, all of these sessions and getting recordings set up and materials prepared. So I appreciate you very much. Appreciate all of our attendees today. Um, wish you health and safety within your own communities. And we look forward to when we will connect again. Thank you.